Nazi Germany was to be a society unlike any other. That was Hitler's ambition, his dream, to lead the greatest nation on earth. Technologically, militarily, scientifically, Germany was to be the envy of the world. Berlin, renamed Germania, would become the most developed and prosperous city in all of history, its magnificence leaving the famed capitals of empires of old, like Rome and Athens, a mere shadow in comparison. Yet just 12 years after his rise to power, Berlin lay in ruins, having been smashed in Allied air raids. Its surviving citizens, living in squalor with most amenities destroyed and supply lines unreliable, were pressed into the defense of a city that was mostly rubble and bodies, while the sound of gunfire and T-34 tanks grew ever closer. Beneath the rubble, in the cramped confines of a bunker built to house the leadership before the end came, Hitler and his Nazi Germany seemed symbiotically connected as both faced impending oblivion. This is the story of the final days of the Fuhrer Adolf Hitler. Welcome to Wars of the World. Construction on a bunker for the German leadership in Berlin began as far back as 1936, beginning life as an air raid shelter before its role began to be expanded as Germany's situation grew more dire by the end of 1944. Located near the Chancellery building itself, the bunker comprised of two interconnected shelters, with the original shelter becoming known as the upper or forward bunker, while the second lower bunker, which became the Führer bunker, was some 2.5 meters further underground and was afforded substantial additional protection with a concrete roof being three meters thick, intended to prevent all but the heaviest of allied bombs from penetrating. From here, the Führer and his upper echelons could continue to command Germany's war effort, as well as the defense of the city, as bombs and artillery shells rained down relentlessly above. Communications to forces outside, initially by way of telephone and radio, became unreliable, and the Führer eventually resorted to boys from the Hitler Youth being used as runners, carrying written messages from Hitler to the few remaining officers of the Wehrmacht. One such runner was Armin Lehmann, who, just at 16 years old, would find himself face to face with the Führer he idolized. Lehmann recalled later how the belief in the Führer still reigned supreme even in those bleak final days, remembering it never entered my mind, even then, as the bombs rained down, that we would lose. Hitler had been forced to take up residence in the bunker on January 16th, 1945. Despite propaganda to the contrary, the Führer seldom spent any time in Berlin during the war, but now he was underneath the capital city, accompanied by his mistress, Eva Braun, his mental health slowly deteriorating as a result of stress, the onset of his Parkinson's disease, and a potent mixture of drugs given to him by his personal physicians. A big believer in German technical superiority, he clung to the belief that wonder weapons like the ME-262 jet fighter, the V-2 ballistic missile, and the Maus super heavy tank would reverse Germany's fortunes but this belief slowly detached him from the reality of the situation, with the infrastructure to support such weapons slowly being pummeled into dust by Allied bombers. The bunker itself also served to detach Hitler even further from the real world he was living in. It had been lavishly decorated, including putting up one of Hitler's favorite paintings of Frederick the Great, and was even afforded a well-stocked wine cellar. Protected and cared for by the services within the bunker, the war situation became an almost metatextual affair for Hitler, something that couldn't possibly reach him, but at the same time affected his ability to lead Germany's defense as the noose closed in between March and April of 1945. Those he shared the bunker with knew the truth. It was a prison of despair, and many of them looked for ways to distract them from their impending doom. Martin Bormann, Hitler's much despised private secretary, became well known for making trips to the wine cellar, 
and indulging in his trademark debauchery with women hiding in the shelter from the Soviet army's rape gangs. The decadence of those in the bunker shook the beliefs of even a committed young Nazi like the 16-year-old Lehman, who saw it firsthand for himself as he was given his messages and then emerged back into the carnage of the street fighting between the city's defenders and the Red Army. On one occasion, after witnessing the orgy of sex and alcohol, Lehman was horrified to find two starving men outside the bunker carving up a wounded horse for food, the poor creature still alive and in pain. Such was the desperation for the ordinary citizen. By the beginning of April 1945, almost two and a half million Red Army soldiers had advanced upon the outskirts of the German capital, and within two weeks had reached the city center despite the determined German resistance. For the remainder of the month, Hitler would stay underground, with the Red Army just a few hundred yards away, chipping away at the defenders like Lehman. As well as fighting inside the city, the Soviet army had also completely encircled it, with Soviet leader Joseph Stalin not wanting any of the Nazi leadership to escape. This had the knock-on effect of also severing almost all communication with the rest of Germany, that was technically still under German control to the West, although the reality of the situation was that many German commanders now found themselves without a Führer who had previously insisted on personally directing much of the war effort. As if this were not enough, Hitler also found his orders to his soldiers inside the city were now also starting to be ignored if those receiving them felt they were suicidal or unreasonable, leading to him suffering a nervous breakdown and declaring for the first time that the war was lost. After this, he began investigating the most reliable method of suicide, leading many in the bunker to feel they were part of a suicide pact. Head of the Luftwaffe, Hermann Goering, offered to resume the leadership of Germany, feeling Hitler had become incapacitated. But Hitler viewed this as treason and demanded Goering resign from all his posts and be arrested. Later, the bunker received news from, of all places, the BBC, in which Hitler learned that Heinrich Himmler, the once vaunted head of the SS, had communicated with the Western Allies, and that he believed Hitler to be dead, and he had assumed the role of the Führer. Himmler had offered to surrender what was left of Germany, but only to them, and not the Soviet Union, but this offer was denied. Upon learning of this act, Hitler was outraged, and ordered that Himmler be arrested and shot for treason. Hermann Fegelein, the SS representative in the bunker who was in custody, having been arrested the day before on charges of desertion, was also shot in the Chancellery Gardens as a warning to others, despite pleas from Ava Braun, Fegelein being married to her sister Gretel, who was due to give birth in days. On April 28th, 1945, the reports from outside the bunker indicated that the Red Army had now reached the Potsdamer Platz in the center of Germany and less than a kilometer away from the bunker. Even with his mind still reeling from the pressures of his situation and the cocktails of drugs he had been receiving, Hitler knew his time was up. His army in tatters, his capital city destroyed, even his most trusted inner circle deserting him. All that was left for Hitler to do was to make the preparations for his own death, so that in one act of defiance, he could at least, to a degree, go out on his own terms. That night, shortly after midnight, in the early hours of April 29th, in a gesture of kindness and appreciation for her service to him, Hitler married Eva Braun. It had been intended that they marry earlier in the day, but the paperwork was not in the bunker for a legal wedding, prompting lawyer Michael Wagner to head out through the war-ravaged streets in an armored car, dodging Russian weapons fire in order to get it for them. Hitler had met Braun when she was employed as an assistant to Hitler's official photographer during the early years of his political career. Of a middle-class Catholic background, Braun spent her time with Hitler largely out of public view, save for when it suited Nazi propaganda, entertaining herself by skiing and swimming. While she had no significant influence on Hitler's political career or his wartime decisions, she did provide him with a degree of normality in an otherwise extraordinary life, and so kept him grounded when he was prone to fits of fantasy or rage. Loyal to the very end, she refused to leave him in the Berlin bunker, despite suggestions she take her chances and attempt to flee. A degree of loyalty he felt was in short supply as he lived through his final hours. 
The ceremony was witnessed by Martin Bormann and the Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels. After a rather modest wedding reception and breakfast, Hitler retired with his private secretary to his office, whereupon he dictated his last will and testament, in which he instructed Joseph Goebbels and Grand Admiral Karl Dönitz to assume Hitler's roles as Chancellor and Head of State, respectively, upon his death. He also made arrangements for what should be done to his body and his new wife's once they were dead, with news from Italy concerning the fate of his ally Benito Mussolini and his mistress inspiring him to take such measures. He wished to avoid the last images of Adolf Hitler to be him strung up from a lamppost like meat in a butcher's shop. In the early hours of April 30th, Hitler looked over the tactical picture one last time, perhaps secretly praying for a miracle at the 11th hour. There was none. German forces in and around the city had been surrounded and were slowly being bled to death. None of them could do anything to help him now. The Luftwaffe had all but ceased to exist, and all but the most radicalized Nazi pilots were taking to the air in an effort to flee the Western Allies, not wanting to be a prisoner at the hands of the Soviets. At around 200 hours, Hitler began meeting the members of the staff in the bunker, including a doctor named Ernst Schneck, who had formerly worked at the Dachau concentration camp, where he participated in experiments on men, women, and children. Looking at Hitler, he would later describe the Führer as looking like a diminished, hunched man with shaking limbs, bloodshot eyes, and an expressionless face. The Führer thanked them for their work and then left the medical staff to engage in one last party, one that was attended by Mrs. Eva Hitler herself. Amidst the celebrations, Schneck left in order to use the toilets and overheard a conversation between Hitler and SS physician Werner Hauser, where Hitler explained that he wanted to die at the exact same time as his wife. The plan involved both Hitler and Eva taking cyanide pills and shooting each other at the same time. But Eva had confessed that she was worried she wouldn't be able to shoot her new husband. Fearing that the cyanide might fail, Hitler had tested a capsule on his beloved dog, Blondie, and the animal died almost instantly. At 600 hours, Soviet soldiers charged the Chancellery building, but were beaten back, and Hitler was advised that they had less than 24 hours before the bunker was captured. An hour later, Hitler followed his wife out of the bunker in order for them to bask in the sunlight one last time. Hitler barely made it to the entranceway before the sound of the war he had instigated forced him to retreat back down for the last time. The couple had lunch later that day and then said thank you to the remaining staff. Despite his previous orders that everyone had to fight to the last or be shot as a coward, Hitler finally lamented and told many of them that at nightfall they should try and make a break for it rather than be captured by the Red Army. At 1430 hours, Adolf and Eva Hitler retreated to his private quarters and closed the door behind them. It was the last time they would be seen alive. After a few hours, Hitler's valet, Heinz Linger, and Martin Bormann entered the room and discovered their lifeless bodies. The Führer, the man who had instigated the most devastating war in history, who had visited such suffering on an industrial scale upon millions, was dead. According to the men's testimonies, the couple, who hadn't even been married for two days, were found sitting on the sofa, with Eva to the left of Hitler, who sat sunken over, with blood pouring from his temple, having at the very least shot himself. Eva, meanwhile, looked comparatively pristine, but the air smelled of almonds, an indication of the release of hydrogen cyanide. Hitler's body was wrapped up in a rug, and the pair were then carried upstairs and into the garden behind the chancellery, where once Hitler had liked to take his dog Blondie for a walk. The pair were doused in petrol, and then, with some difficulty, set on fire. The flames soon covered the bodies and destroyed them beyond recognition, eradicating one of the most evil men in history. But while the physical being may have been gone, the legacy of the tyrant lives on in various forms even today. The world was shaped by the heinous acts of Hitler and his underlings. However, our history since then has been one of humanity trying to make sense of just how one man can cause so much devastation, and hopefully, how to prevent it from happening again. Sadly, as tyrants and their wars continue to wage on almost every continent, it seems it is a lesson we are yet to fully learn.